finished off with uh, contingencies, right? Human contingent learning. Is that what the last thing we did? I think so. Because uh, I didn't talk about semantic learning or episodic memory learning, right? That doesn't sound familiar? Okay. Uh, I don't think I had episodic on there because we talked about that in the next unit, but I'm going to mention it here. So if you want to add it, go ahead. Uh, it might be on the quiz. I'm not sure if it is or not. I forget. All right. So if we're talking about learning, what about behaviorism? We learned about um, observational learning, right? Modeling, seeing a behavior, and then uh, uh, mimicking the behavior, right? In the correct context, right? Why, why did the chimpanzee and the plate thing not count as uh, observational learning? Because he's just copying your movements, not what you're actually doing. It's not comprehending. Yeah it's, yeah, it's just motor movement, basically. It has nothing to do with what you're actually uh, trying to accomplish, right? Because the monkey, remember, the monkey will wash the plate even if it's clean, or even if it's dirty, they're not going to actually wash it. They'll just kind of rub it like, like they saw the person do. Okay. Um, oh, remind me real quick, by the way. So this contingencies uh, portion about associations. We humans kind of uniquely are able to assess which stimuli actually uh, have an impact uh, or are st correctly associated with a certain response. So like I give you a whole bunch of factors and you could probably tell me which ones likely caused that response. Uh, animals can't. Uh, does anybody remember what it was called when uh, they experimented with mice and they figured out they could not draw new associations if one was already there? The blocking. Yeah, blocking effect, right? And if you guys forgot, that was where <coughs> they taught them to associate the light with food. And then what was step two once that was successful? They added the tone, so it was light and tone. And they would still salivate, right, for the food. But then what happened when they took the light out, but they kept the tone? They wouldn't salivate, right? They, it was like that association had blocked because it was taken by one. Uh, we're, we, we humans, though, were able to assess uh, multiple uh, variables, multiple factors. Uh, and so we're relatively able to understand the actual contingencies uh, and learn and apply them. All right. Um, there's sort of, this could go with observational learning or simply learning through uh, listening to somebody, right, through language. I could just explain something to you and you could probably understand most things. Uh, there are some things you've got to see and there are some things that are too in-depth for me just to tell you. But there are concepts I can just explain to you with words and writing or language um, that you could learn and understand and remember. All right. Uh, I would assume we all know what the capital of the United States is, correct? What is it? Oh, good. I want to see if you're like, Washington, D.C.? <coughs> yeah. That's right. It's Washington, D.C. Have you been there? Yes. No. A couple of you probably have. I was there when I was in eighth grade. Yeah, uh, some of us have been there. Do I need to have been there to know that is the capital of the United States? No. No, I don't. Um, so that's just kind of memorizing a fact. Maybe you saw it on a map. Maybe you just learned it from your teacher or whatever. Um, does anybody remember the time and date and the event in which they were taught that Washington, D.C. was the capital. He'd be like, I remember it was in fourth grade, and my teacher told us and showed us on a map, and I remember that moment, just like it happened yesterday. Anybody remember that? No. Probably not. But do you still know Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States? Yeah. Right, okay. That's called semantic learning or semantic memory, all right? So this is, and, and it might make more sense once I give you the alternative here, semantic uh, learning, or in this case, memory. Um, this is <clears throat> learning uh, not dependent on spatial or uh, spatial or temporal, which means like in time, like remembering that moment, or temporal uh, location, spatial or temporal location. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Location. What I mean by that is we all know facts about things that we haven't actually seen or been to, and we don't remember the day in which we learn them. We just gradually learn them over time through language, through maybe seeing pictures, whatever. Uh, that's semantic learning, and that's semantic memory. There's a whole bunch of facts you know, but you haven't actually been there. Maybe you've even seen a picture of it. You probably have, though. Like, capital of France. Most of us know that, right? Yes. What is it? Paris. Ooh, even less people were uh, used to that one. But it's true. Yeah. Um, so you know this, but uh, I would assume most of you that said that have not been to Paris. Maybe you have. Uh, but most of us have not. But you know that, right? I didn't have to actually be there, and I 
almost certainly don't remember the, the, the time that I first heard that that was true and remember learning it in third grade or fifth grade or, or whatever it was, all right? But I remember the fact nonetheless, and that, that can be through observation. Uh, I could perhaps experience it, uh, and I could perhaps um, learn it through an image or whatever, uh, but I don't necessarily need to recall the moment in time uh, or the location I was at to uh, recall it. Does that kind of make sense a little bit? All right, maybe it'll make more sense if I give you the other version, because there's another type of learning slash memory, which is called episodic, or episodic, but I call it episodic learning or memory. This is a memory or learning that is dependent on, but more so memory, that's dependent on remembering the exact time and location. So there are specific events in our life that we'll actually remember the event itself. All right, so what are some events that you might remember in your life? You guys weren't alive for 9-11, that's the typical example that you weren't alive, or you weren't conscious even if you were. No, you weren't even alive. Were you guys born in 2001? Mm -hmm. You're 2002, 2003? Yeah, but no, you weren't, because that was, was in September. So yeah, you guys weren't even in, you just, wow, you didn't exist yet. All right, <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, you didn't even exist yet. I, I was a kid, I was like 11 or 12, so I guess it makes sense. But anyways, um, so what's something you'd remember in your life? You can't remember on birth. You guys haven't been married yet, you haven't had kids yet. You know, graduating eighth grade. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do some of you remember that day? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. You probably don't remember what date it was, right? No. You can't be like, it was June 4th, whatever, 2000, whatever. Uh, but maybe you do. No, I, oh, your siblings birth? You might, yeah, if you're old enough. Like, I, don't, I was two when my brother was born, so I don't remember that. But yeah, you might remember your siblings birth if you were old enough. Uh, and you can probably, if you're old enough, remember like that exact location too, like what the room looked like or, or whatever. That's an episodic uh, memory uh, or learning. You're actually recalling the specific time and location. That's different from um, learning something and, and, and just learning it as a fact through language uh, or over time. So many, many, uh, much learning actually starts out this way, but it becomes this. Like I still remember all these facts about things, but I can't remember the exact moment or location I learned them. All right, so that's the difference between them. So that's semantic learning. Again, I can explain something to you, you could see it, you could experience it, and then it just gets stored as a fact, uh, separated entirely from the actual episode in which you learned or experienced it, if that makes sense. And those are two different types of memories and two different uh, types of uh, uh, learning potentially, but usually it starts like this and turns to this. But and this is, again, this is very similar to the actual memory unit, which is literally the next notebook page, so this might make it easier to comprehend when we go into memory. Uh, but that's the difference between the two. So do we kind of understand the difference between episodic and semantic? Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. So semantic's more about, like, meaning. All right, that's actually what kind of the word itself means. And uh, episodic is more about the actual location and event that you can recall specifically. You guys got that? Mm -hmm. All right, we do learn uh, in both ways and remember in both ways. So that's the difference between those two. Any questions? All right, is that the last thing about learning? Then we're going on to, no, two more, three more. One's kind of not, not real, <coughs> and the other two are. Yeah, I, I've heard several <coughs> really prominent um, psychologists, uh, Stephen Pinker, probably the most prominent. There's other ones too, like Jonathan Haidt, uh, Jordan Peterson, and others, uh, and they do not agree with emotional learning or emotional intelligence. Uh, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt and uh, realize that even if you don't believe it, even if there's not good evidence for it, it still could be on the AP test because it's part of the curriculum. That is annoying that little piece. Um, it could be on the test, so that's why I'm telling it to you. And again, I myself, hold on, I myself don't know all of the specific research on it or evidence for it, uh, but I, I'm just gonna kind of tell you what, like, for example, Steven Pinker says about uh, emotional learning and emotional uh, intelligence and why they don't quite think you can label it as such. So we've got three more to talk about. I'm just gonna erase these so I have more space. Uh, I'll do emotional learning first, because I just mentioned it. So again, I don't really want you to necessarily think that this is real, maybe it is, but from what most of the prominent psychologists are saying, there's not a lot of good evidence to support it, uh, because it's kind of, a mix of things. It's almost like 
Well, I'm not going to go that far. I'll wait to get into the intelligence portion. No, maybe I'll go that far. Emotional learning. This is basically, and I'm generalizing here, this is basically your ability uh, to uh, see, observe, and learn to understand oops, understand, uh, and control, perhaps, to an extent, uh, your emotions, or see them in others or see, understand in others, uh, and use them to your uh, advantage, or use them to predict outcomes. All right, I've given you an example of this already. Uh, do I ask my mom for something when she's in a bad mood? No. no, right? Do I make an important decision when I am in a mood that is very sad or very uh, uh, angry? or very, even very happy. Is it a good idea to make a long-term decision based on that, or when I'm in that state? No. no, why not? Some of you say no, just based on my tone, but why not? Why shouldn't I make a, a long-term decision like moving, uh, changing majors, <coughs> changing jobs, leaving or entering a relationship? Why shouldn't I make those decisions when I'm very sad or very mad or very happy? You're making those decisions like based on what you're feeling at the moment, but when your like mood regulates, maybe you will like regret it. Yeah, uh, very close. Uh, I don't, you're not even wrong. I, I would just be a little more specific in that those emotional states are going to skew your perception. You're going to see things differently than they maybe actually are. All right. Uh, if you're particularly angry at a person, or particularly sad about something, or particularly happy with your life or a person. You're more likely to see that thing as, if you're happy, really good, and it can't go wrong. Uh, or if you're really mad, uh, really terrible, and I just want to get out of this no matter what. Uh, or if you're really sad, uh, probably a similar situation where uh, you feel like, again, <coughs> there, it, it's hopeless and you should give up or, or whatever. Does it mean that that is true? That any of those assertions are true? No, not necessarily. All right, so usually when you make long-term decisions, you don't wanna, you, wanna, you wanna wait, essentially, just in case you're in one of those emotional states that makes you super optimistic, like, oh yeah, we got this, no problem, but you don't got it at all. Or uh, you're really angry and upset at a person or yourself, or you're really sad about something, or, or, or you're feeling depressed or whatever. It's not a good idea to make those decisions because it's gonna skew your judgment, it'll change your perception. So generally, when you're making a big decision, obviously what you choose to drink for dinner can be based on your mood because who cares? It's one little thing. Um, but if it's a long-term decision, that's when you want to wait because your, your perception could be skewed by your actual emotional state, right? Like just, we'll use the same thing as the mom thing. Uh, asking your mom to go out and stay out past 10 p.m. or I don't know what your curfew is, uh, like 10 p.m., should that be dependent on if she's happy or not? It shouldn't, right? Does it change any fact about you coming home later or not? No, but what happens if you ask when she's angry? She's less likely to say yes for any reason besides the fact that she's just in a bad mood. You guys don't know how to answer this. Possibly, but probably not, right? If she says yes just because she's in a good mood or no just because she's in a bad mood, what actually changed about the outcome of that, that you want? Did that change the fact that you are or aren't coming home after 10? Did it change the fact that uh, uh, you're trustworthy? No, it didn't. It just changed the perception of the person that's, that's uh, about to engage in the action. So what we're talking about here with emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize and understand uh, um, your emotions and the emotions of others, and then uh, learn what those predict as far as outcomes. And you guys, you already know it. You don't ask your mom to do something when she's in a bad mood because the outcome is likely to be uh, something you don't want. If like, hey, can I have this? Probably not if they're in a bad mood or they're mad at you. If they're in a great mood though, your chances are increased if they're in a good mood, right? So you already kind of understand that. Uh, so some people call this emotional learning and again, sort of understanding your own emotions too, when and when not to do things based on your mood. Um, some people call it emotional learning and emotional intelligence and they say that you can learn to understand others and their perspectives and use empathy and compassion to uh, further yourself in life. But um, what the top psychologists have been saying is there's not a lot of evidence for that. And we'll get into that more when we get into intelligence and personality. I'll just leave it at that for right now. Uh, but uh, there's not a lot of support for it because it's basically just intelligence in the first place. Like my ability to see, wow, when that person's in a good mood, 
this is a much more likely outcome. Oh, when they're in a bad mood, that's a much less likely outcome. That's just intelligence. You're observing and seeing a pattern, you're applying logic to understand, and uh, you're trying to increase the probability of the outcome you like. So you realize pretty quickly, don't ask for things when people are in bad moods, right? Ask for things when they're in good moods, because that's when they're more, more likely to say yes. Do you have to be like emotionally intelligent for that, or can you just recognize that? I think the difference is, what they're trying to say is, if you can develop your emotional capacity for understanding and compassion and empathy, that you'll be able to do this. But I could see that and know that even if I don't care how the person feels. Like, I, maybe I don't give a damn if the person's upset or not, but I know how they're gonna react, right? So I don't have to like be empathetic and feel it and share it. I can understand the perspective and just not care myself. It's kind of like about how you asked yesterday, um, is empathy the reason why you feel good when you help people? It's like yes and no. Uh, part of it's just because some people like people liking them, so it makes them feel good to do it. Uh, whereas some people, it doesn't really help them at all, but they can still understand the perspective and, and know what they're going through or, or even you know, feel it themselves. All right, so uh, that's essentially what it is. Seeing it at others, observing patterns, and then trying to use it to uh, predict outcomes. All right, and again, that's kind of the, 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 the formula for intelligence just in general. Uh, observe, process, patterns out there in the real world. Uh, use uh, uh, logic um, to try to, uh, to understand these patterns. And then of course you try to use your knowledge to try to predict outcomes. I gave you a couple examples. Somebody give an example of this little uh, 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 series, a sequence of what you could call, and most people do sort of define intelligence as, whether it's emotional or just intelligence in general. Apply to emotions if you want. How could I use this? Observing and seeing patterns over time, using log logically applying those patterns to try to predict an outcome. <coughs> I gave you a couple examples. Somebody else give me one. Go. Oh, you don't want the same one? Uh, try to give me a new, a new one. Okay, so um, you need your brother to drive you somewhere. Okay. Well, you already see he's in a bad mood. And you remember last time when you asked him if he wanted to drive you somewhere and he was in a bad mood, he didn't let you go. So you're going to wait, which is the logic part, because you understand that he's not going to let you go. So you're going to wait until he's in a better mood, because you're going to predict that he's not going to let you go. Right. Once he's in a better mood, then you'll ask him. Exactly, okay. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned that specific, and that works perfectly, by the way. Uh, you see your brother's in a bad mood, you remember when he's in a bad mood, he doesn't say yes to things, so you logically apply, well, if I ask for it now, it's probably not going to work out, so you wait until they're in a better mood, stable or happy, then it's much more likely to get the outcome you want. Okay, um, do I have to only, okay, what if I never saw my brother in a bad mood? Would I know based on my observations of other people that asking people when they're in a bad mood is a bad idea? Could I apply that to my brother if I've never seen him in a bad mood? Yes. You could, right? It's, that's you understanding the patterns of people and behaviors, right? Uh, and you can see individual differences, like some people do react differently than others, um, and then you would note that. But yeah, that's essentially the process. So me being able to or feeling or sharing the experience doesn't necessarily mean I can't understand that process. In fact, psychopaths, you guys know what psychopaths are? You actually probably don't, but you've heard of them. Uh, psychopaths are people that essentially they're really impulsive, so they want to do crazy things, and they can't stop. And also, uh, it doesn't be crazy, by the way, it's any impulse. They're really, they have very poor inhibition control. So they're, they're unlikely to stop themselves if something's a bad idea. Also, they lack guilt or remorse or what you could say is empathy. Like, if they do something bad to you, they don't actually see you as a person, and they can't, therefore, assume that you are hurt by it. So they don't feel any guilt. So if I did something terrible to you and I'm a psychopath and you're just destroyed by it, like I lied to you, stole money from you, uh, I, I don't know, did something terrible, whatever it would be, uh, lied about you, ruined your reputation and job, I wouldn't actually feel guilty for it. That's what a psychopath would do. It would, you wouldn't even see it in their face, their body behavior at all. They might lie to you and say they're sorry because they know they're supposed to, uh, but they don't feel it. Uh, and psychopaths do this. They don't feel it themselves, like they'll never feel guilty if they're actually psychopath for doing something bad to you. But they know, oh, when people act like this, that means um, uh, I did something wrong. So 
if I want to seem normal, I have to uh, <laughs> pretend to be sorry or say I'm sorry or lie about it and say, oh, I didn't do that actually. It was this person or this thing happened instead. They still understand that, uh, you know, this sequence uh, and, and emo how emotions work, they just can't feel the guilt directly and understand you specifically, if that makes sense. But they can still observe it and note, oh, when people smile, that means they're happy. And oh, when people cry, that means they're sad, you know, and so they kind of figure out how to act around you, if that makes sense. All right, so that's what emotional learning is, kind of, like developing compassion, understanding, and learning how to uh, note and uh, use emotions in yourself and others uh, to increase the likelihood of an outcome. But again, it's pretty much indistinguishable from just intelligence itself. Okay, uh, but no, that, that is a term you may have to write about, that's all it is. Just apply your knowledge of intelligence and just make it specifically about emotions. There you go. All right, there's uh, also two forms of un, what you call unrealized learning. This is learning that I didn't know I had learned previously. Like I didn't consciously learn it, but I do remember it. Because at some point I took the information in, right, sensory, and then I processed it somehow and stored it, even though I wasn't aware of it. So there's two examples of this. There is, first of all, uh, insight learning. This one's the craziest one. I'm actually gonna describe this one last. And there's also latent learning. This one first, even though I wrote it second. All right, latent, by the way, means hidden. Uh, manifest means to uh, make it known and use it. Latent means it's like hidden, underlying. Uh, either it's unknown or it's uh, intentionally, cryptically uh, hidden, all right? So if I say, for example, well, I'll use the example I gave before. I walk up to a person and they did something stupid. And I go, wow, you're really smart. What's the, uh, what's the, uh, uh, what's the literal meaning of what I said? That you are smart. Well, what's the latent meaning of my statement there? That you're dumb, right? It's it's it's, it's sarcasm. It's it's irony, right? So um, latent's like the uh, the the undercoating, like I said, the uh, the the non-explicit um, learning in this case for learning. So here's what I'm talking about. I would bet that you could probably, even though you didn't intentionally memorize this, could you tell me all of the people you've talked to today? Mm -hmm. Try it right now. Go through your head. Try like rewind or however you remember it. I, I personally like re-rewind and, and trace my steps when I'm doing it. But you could probably pretty accurately recall every person today you've talked to, even though you were not trying to memorize it. You didn't always be like, all right, come in today and ask you who you talked to today. And you would try to memorize it. We're not doing that. But can you pretty accurately, at least you think, recall who you've talked to today? You can probably even remember where and how you talked to them, right? Probably not what they're wearing, maybe what they're wearing. Uh, but you can probably remember those details. Can you remember what you had for dinner or lunch or breakfast or all yesterday? Can you? Try to. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes you can't, but sometimes you can, correct? Yes. That's called latent learning. So that's, real, that's learning I didn't even realize that I learned. So you're just like going about your day, derp, 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 and taking information, sensory information. You're processing it. Some of it goes, isn't stored, but some of it is randomly for whatever reason. That's latent learning. All right. How about this? If I dropped you in the middle of San Francisco and uh, you had no directions, no phone, and you had to make it to uh, Pier 39, which is oh, just, well, whatever, just the, the bay, the bay, um, you could go there. And when you got to the bay, whichever street you popped out on, I would bet I could ask you, how did you get here? And you probably wouldn't be able to tell me street names, but you could probably retrace your steps, correct? You could probably go the reverse path and be like, oh yeah, yeah, that was that Walgreens I walked by, and oh yeah, there's that gas station I walked by. Could you probably do that? Yeah. Most of us could, right? That's latent learning. Uh, you're learning these markers and remembering these things even though you didn't intentionally learn them. Does that make sense? All right, so this is non-intentional learning you're not even aware of. The only way you know you're aware of it is if you're asked about it. Like, would you have ever thought, who did I talk to today at, you know, almost 10 a.m.? 
No. How did you, did you realize you memorized those things? No, no you didn't. What's the only time you realized that you did learn them? Right. When I asked you, right. That's late in learning. So it's stuff you learned without knowing it, and you only realize you learned it when you're <laughs> asked about it or you have to use the information. All right. That would happen too. Let's say, uh, let's give the same example. Let's say you do, uh, are in San Francisco. You're in a car, you've got your phone, you're using the GPS, you're driving along, you get to your destination, and you go to go home, and for whatever reason, like you just don't have service, or uh, your phone died, I don't know, and your charger's not working, so you have no, you have no GPS. You're all on your own. Could you probably find your way back to some, to some extent? It might be hard to find the exact freeway because there's a lot of terms, but you could probably go and retrace your steps a good portion of the way, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, why is that latent learning? Correct. Right, okay, so uh, I didn't intentionally learn it. That's not like 100% of it though. So you're, you're half right, I'll still give you the, the points for that. You're half right. You didn't intentionally learn it, but I guess I'll, I'll stick with you, maybe you can answer it. How did you realize you did learn it though? Yeah, when you're forced to use it, when someone asks you about it, or you're forced to use it, like, oh, we're stuck, how do we get back? Well, we went this way, so that's kind of when you realize you actually learned it or not. All right, I think I missed one from you and you, too. All right, um, so this, again, is, uh, I don't want to say accidental, but learning, we only realize after we've been asked about it or have to use it unexpected oops unexpectedly so I can't plan for latent learning because I'm not going to know that I had to know the information I'm only going to realize I learned if someone asks me or if I'm forced to use it because I'm lost or, or whatever all right that makes sense all right insight an insight this is a weird phenomenon we actually don't understand this one uh, but it does happen because if you think about it like where do ideas come from like if you're just sitting there and all of a sudden you think of a new idea like oh I could do this instead like where where did that come from like if you got a problem what could be a problem let's say you're uh, let's say you are uh, what's a problem you could have Let's say you, uh, you've got a boyfriend or girlfriend and um, you realize that they get mad at you every once in a while. And you're like, why the hell are they mad at me? And you don't, and you don't get it. Like they're not saying it, even though they should, but they're not saying it. Uh, and then all of a sudden one day you're like, I know, it's because, now I gotta think of something. <laughs> it's because I, uh, I don't, what? Okay, oh, how about this? This is probably more specific. Uh, when I hang out with my friends, I don't pay attention to my phone. How about that? So, you could be like, that's why. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's because when they try to contact me, whatever form that is that they use, uh, I'm with my friends, so I'm not paying attention to my phone, so I like make them wait way too long, or at least what they think is too long. All right, so that would be an, uh, an example of insight learning. Like, did I use some like process to figure it out? Did somebody tell it to me? No, how did I how did I come to uh, learn it or know it? It just popped into your head, right, out of seemingly nowhere. That's what insight learning or, or insight itself is. This is a uh, uh, learning or ideas, you could say. This is also a form of problem solving. We'll get we'll talk about it later. Uh, learning or ideas, uh, we never <coughs> intentionally uh, uh, manufacture. Uh, or even learn before. So they just come out of nowhere. You know, you know, like in comics when they're like, someone has an idea and a light bulb pops up in their head? That's an insight. It just comes out of nowhere. All right, and, uh, and we don't even, by the way, know where ideas come from, especially if it's a creative idea. Like if you're the first person to ever think of something, it's like, where the hell did that come from? Like all of a sudden, 
Jeff Bezos is like, what if we use drones to deliver packages? Like, where did that come from, right? Or, or uh, the, per the people that, you know, invented the internet. There was no internet before. How the hell did they think of that? Oh, let's connect all of our computers with binary language and networks that go across uh, interfaces and are interpreted by a, a machine. What? Like, where did that come from? No one had anything like that. Or you mentioned the phone. Any of these things, like, people just thought of these ideas out of nowhere that they had no, like, you know, help developing. They just popped into their head and then they made them happen. That, that's insight. Uh, it's where, again, it just comes to you. By the way, um, insight is much more common later on. So let's say I've got a problem. I'm like, man, I don't know how to, uh, what's a problem? Let's say you're doing a project. You're writing, here we go. You have to like write an essay for English class or, or whatever class. Wouldn't be this class if we do all writing here. Otherwise you guys plagiarize. Um, so you have to do writing and uh, uh, you're like, you're stuck. You're like, man, I don't know what to talk about. I wrote a paragraph or two and I just don't know what else to write. I can't think about it. And then you go, okay, I'll just do it later. And then you go to sleep, you wake up the next day and all of a sudden you're like, oh, and then you just start writing and you've got the, you finished the essay. What happened? Insight. Insight, right. Um, usually, if you wait, um, we, we think it's because uh, during your dreaming process, you actually are actively thinking about this problem, uh, and you're practicing <coughs> or trying to problem solve, and then all of a sudden, it kind of helps you find this insight. So when they say sleep on it, they mean, well, for two reasons. Number one, make sure it's actually a good idea, you're not just affected by an emotional state. And also, if it's a problem, you might practice or think about it in your sleep or when you're dreaming and just come up with an idea the next day as a result. And it really does work, by the way. There's been plenty of times where I'm making something uh, for a, an online thing or whatever, uh, or there's some sort of problem in my or somebody else's life I'm just trying to think about what to do, and I, I don't have anything really that day. And then a day or two later, I'm just like, do, 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 and then I'll just come to me. Um, it, it, they, again, they think it's largely because of the uh, sleeping and dreaming process. Is it like when you have an argument with someone, and then like an hour later, you're like, dang, I should have said that? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, that's it's similar. It, it is similar. Yeah, as long as you're not like using some process to go through and, and, and come to that conclusion, if it's just coming out of thin air, that would be an example. Yeah, you argue with somebody and they make you mad, and you're like, damn it. And then you go about your day, and you're like, oh, I should have said this. But yeah, that's, that's an example of insight. Uh, some of that could just be that you're, uh, uh, dang, I forgot the term. When you, uh, not a mnemonic. Sometimes there's like a trigger where if you think about something, it'll remind you of something else. So it could be that, that's not insight. But yeah, if it's a brand new idea out of nowhere, uh, then yeah, that would, be, that would be insight. Okay, um, so that's the difference between insight learning and late learning. And this is learning I didn't realize that I did, and I only know I learned it when I have to use it or I'm asked about it. And again, if you ever wanna think of an example, you got lost and you have to retrace your steps, you probably can. Uh, if somebody asks you what you ate the other day, you can probably remember something. Uh, you, you can retrace your steps pretty much pretty well in a day. If, you, if like you lost your phone, for example, and you're like third period comes like, oh damn it, where's my phone? Uh, could you retrace your steps? Yes. For the most part, you could. Certainly, you know the, the classes you went to, but you probably also know where you were at break or who you talked to, and you could check with them. All right. Any questions about insight or latent learning? All right. Let's talk about behavior. <clears throat> which I think is the last section to talk about. All right, behavior, which topics though? Self-control, modification? All right, fair enough. <laughs> so behavior, um, there are a few things, okay, so I've told you this before, by the way. Our behavior is not determined by any one thing. It's a mix of genetic and environmental factors and epigenetic factors, and also the environment, like the situation you're in, all right? That can affect your behavior. I'm much more likely to do something that's dangerous or wrong if no one's around, or if my friends are around than if adults are around, or a teacher's around, or an officer is around, like, obviously, right? Um, so when I'm, oh, this is perfect, because we just talked about psychopaths. Um, is there, <coughs> Are there mechanisms in your brain that can hold you back if you need to be held back? Yes. If you've got like an impulse, an idea, yeah, there are, where are they at? Frontal, Frontal lobe. lobe, right, okay. Psychopaths, since I mentioned it already. Uh, psychopaths, <coughs> in their frontal lobe, um, whether it's, I forget if it's the dorsal medial or the ventral medial, um, they may have incomplete, damaged, or malfunctioning uh, circuits in their frontal lobe. 
So that makes psychopaths way more likely to not uh, control their impulse as well. All right, so that impulse of I want to do this thing, even though it's a bad idea, the odds they will stop themselves are much lower than normal people. All right, so you got you understand that a little bit. All right, so <clears throat> that's self control. That's where I really want to do something, but I hold back because I know there's either negative consequences or perhaps I will benefit by waiting. Okay, um, what's an example when you could benefit by waiting? Oh, here, here's a basic example. If you are in an argument with somebody, let's say it's over text or whatever social media platform you're using, uh, or even it's on the phone, you may have like an impulse to say something mean to them, um, but you know that if you wait and you calm down and you think about it, you'll come up with a better solution or a better answer, or certainly one that's not going to make the person just angry and, and not fix the fight. So me holding back and not doing that is an example of, of, of uh, self-discipline, all right? So self-discipline is a uh, major factor, or self-control rather, sorry. Self-control is a major factor in determining your behavior. Again, this is largely frontal lobe based, frontal lobe. Because again, it's part of goal setting and planning. Like my frontal lobe is the best part of my brain, if not the only part of my brain, that thinks ahead. Like, no, 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 this is a bad idea because later on, it'll be worse. Or later on, if I don't do this, it'll be better. All right, that's kind of what puts the brakes on for us. Uh, so self-control, large in the frontal lobe, uh, but this allows us, to, uh, allows us to stop or inhibit uh, certain behaviors. For our own benefit. All right. Um, here's an example. If I'm trying to lose weight or maintain my weight, whatever it might be, or even gain weight, maybe if you're bodybuilding or, or something, <clears throat> and I have a diet, and it consists of, let's say, this meal I eat, um, I don't know, cashews, strawberries, and olives. There's a weird mix. Those are the first things that pop in my head. Uh, that's your diet, but you eat them, uh, and you're still hungry, or you just, you've had that thing too many times, this is part of your diet, you want something else, and you see that there is, um, what kind of ice cream would there be? I really like the Chunky Monkey from, uh, from, um, Ben and Jerry's, ben and Jerry's yeah, that one's really good. So, whatever, imagine whatever you want, Cherry Garcia is also really good, um, but anyways, there it is, and it's like I could either eat my uh, meal that I prepared that's more amount of calories, or I can just indulge and way overeat on this super, super, super uh, calorie dense ice cream that tastes really good. All right, that's the impulse, right? The impulse is I don't wanna do this, I wanna do this, because it's way more fun. Um, will that do anything bad to me at the time? No, it'll actually feel good at the time, right? I'll be like, mm, and I get a bunch of dopamine. But what happens in the long run? Yeah, you'll, you'll break your diet and, and possibly gain weight or whatever and make yourself more likely to do it again in the future, all that stuff. So your ability to, to hold back on a behavior that uh, might harm you in the future or wait for a, a, a benefit uh, in the future, that's your self-control. <clears throat> and you can actually test at a very young age how good someone's self-control is, essentially meaning, again, how strong the circuitry in their frontal lobe is. So they actually can test this in uh, toddlers as early as uh, age two and three, and they did. And this is the uh, famous marshmallow test. So here's the marshmallow test. <clears throat> they took kids and after they, they were, were already at a certain point of hunger. Like it's not like some of the kids were hungry and some of the kids were full. They like had, a, they had lunch and then whatever amount of time went by, they uh, came in to these toddlers and they said, okay, <clears throat> Um, here's a marshmallow, and again, again, they only selected kids that liked marshmallows because otherwise there'd be no point. Um, here's a marshmallow. If you wait five minutes without eating that marshmallow, we will come back and you'll get another marshmallow. If you eat it before that five minutes is up, though, you will not get another marshmallow. All right, so they do that. Here you go, here you go. and they place the marshmallow in front of the kid, one of those big fluffy ones that they like chewing on. They put it right in front of them and they leave and they watch for five minutes and they come back. 
When they come back, some kids have eaten the uh, marshmallow. Some kids have not eaten the marshmallow. Which group <coughs> had better self-control? <coughs> exactly, the ones who did not. <coughs> well, that it's like, whatever, okay, good job not eating the marshmallow. <coughs> good self-control, toddler. That might not mean anything. But they followed up with these kids later in life uh, as adults, <coughs> and they kept the results. Which, by the way, again, be a longitudinal study, right? Large periods of time uh, for one group following it. Um, the kids that were able to resist their urges and wait to get the benefit, they actually did better in all markers of life. They were more successful financially, they had better relationships, they were more organized, and they were less anxious across the board. Why do you think that is? This is on average, by the way. I'm sure there were individuals that that was not true of, but if you took the two groups and compared the numbers and averaged them, the group that waited had better lives on pretty much every marker than the group that did not wait. Why? Because Wait, hold on a second. You can lie, she does not usually. I'm going to give it to her. <laughs> go. Okay, that's only one instance, though. How does that make their whole life better? <coughs> maybe, maybe not. Got anything else? Okay, you got you got a good chunk of it. You got another. You want to take a shot? I will go you and then you and then you. Okay, so um, basically, the people that <coughs> do not eat the marshmallow have more self-control, so they won't do things that are temporary happiness, but they'll go for something that has longer types of happiness, because they know that they'll get the second marshmallow if they don't eat it. So that's that's what their goal was. The people who ate the marshmallow was have that temporary happiness instead of looking towards what would benefit them in the future. Okay, how does that make their lives better in their 20s and 30s? Because in their 20s and 30s, because like, if they were in high school and they knew that if you got better grades, then you would, if you got better grades instead of gaming a lot, then you get into a better college and you have a better job. So they continue to study more. But the group that ate that ate the marshmallow wouldn't think of like further into their life about college and such. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, that's that's good enough for me to say you did. It. I'm gonna I'm gonna refine a little bit. And you got half of it. And then I think she completed it sort of. So um, this is one little instance, right, for one moment in their life. But what it does demonstrate is depending on the situation, it likely shows that which group uh, has better self-control than others. Um, true or false, life is full of thousands and thousands and thousands, if not millions, of little teeny decisions where we often have to exhibit our self-control. True. So if I follow a kid who's got better self-control than another across a whole lifetime, his good decisions and waiting and planning uh, are going to outweigh or, or be a, a better net benefit across time than the uh, kid who uh, chose, not chose, the kid who has worse impulse control, has less self-control. Because they're more likely to, across a lifetime, make those impulsive decisions, the ones that harm them in the short term, and, and uh, sorry, benefit them in the short term, but harm them in the long term. And the kids with self-control are more likely to make the decisions that maybe aren't as fun in the short term, but they help them out in the long term. And you follow out for 20, 30 years, and you've got two different people as far as how successful and happy they are or may be. Uh, and that was a pretty good indicator of that. This has been replicated, by the way, with other, other similar um, uh, experiments. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty, it's valid. It's predictive and it's valid. So that's self-control. So this is how uh, um, we can actually control and uh, have some say in our behavior. We can also, too, what's my next topic? We can also modify our behavior. That's what I want to talk about. Modify our behavior. So you can actually use some of these behaviorist tactics to help out yourself. You can help yourself get rid of some behaviors you don't like, and you can also help yourself uh, promote behaviors you do want. All right. Um, so for example, we've got, I think we've got what, taste aversion. Uh, token economy. Is this token economy in there? It's not, but I'm going to add it anyway. Um, and the law of effect. I'll actually start with the law of effect. All right. So, behavior modification is basically you using either classical conditioning or operant conditioning to encourage 
or discourage a behavior. So here's an example of taste aversion. Uh, this doesn't work all the time, but it does work sometimes. Uh, they can use classical conditioning to uh, make you or help you stop smoking or drinking. It's actually pretty interesting too. So what I mean by that is, uh, I think John Garcia pioneered this, if I'm not mistaken. If you can make a negative association in your mind about um, a certain stimuli or stimulus, you can actually help yourself avoid it. So here's an example. Uh, let's say I'm a smoker and I wanna stop because I know it's really bad in the long run, right? Uh, I know it'll get, it's likely to be cancer, emphysema, all this terrible stuff. But it's really hard because I'm addicted to nicotine, right? We talked about that too, the addiction, the withdrawal. So it's really, really hard to do that. Um, one of the things they can do is uh, they can go to a behavior specialist uh, and um, they can uh, practice uh, taste aversion. They can form an association with cigarettes that makes them feel nauseous, so it makes them less likely to smoke. So what they could do is they could put a, uh, um, they could, you know, for a few days or whatever, take all their cigarettes and they could put this super nasty chemical on it that won't kill them or anything, but it tastes disgusting. Like it makes them nauseous. They won't be able to actually <coughs> use the cigarette because it's so uh, dissatisfying. So they do that for however many days they need to. And their brain forms this association of, uh, in this classical conditioning, when I uh, uh, touch a cigarette or put it to my mouth, I get this disgusting, nauseous feeling, and it makes you not want to do it. Because your body anticipates the nausea and discomfort, and it makes you more likely to not actually take the, uh, uh, use the um, uh, cigarette. You can do the same thing for drinking. What they do is they have you drink alcoholic drinks, but they put this stuff in it that makes you nauseous um, and or throw up, depending on the person. Um, so your body starts to associate drinking with yeah, nausea or throwing up. So when you go to drink, you have an urge to drink, your body has the association, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, oh, it makes you feel nauseous in advance. Just like the uh, ring of the bell makes them salivate. Like you anticipate the drink, you feel nauseous beforehand, and then you don't even want to drink because you feel nauseous. All right, that's what taste aversion actually is. And John Garcia figured this out with rats. Uh, it's actually kind of sad. Uh, what he did with them was he would um, feed them every day at the same time. And uh, they would eat normally, but what he started doing is he would uh, irradiate them. And what that means is he'd use radiation uh, to uh, make these rats feel nauseous, and then he'd feed them like simultaneously. So he'd use radiation, make them feel nauseous, and feed them, all right? So are they gonna eat when they're nauseous? No, even if they do, they're gonna throw it up. So pretty soon, he stopped uh, irradiating them, and he would just feed them, and they wouldn't eat the food. Why would they not eat the food? They associated with the nausea. So they either thought it caused the nausea or just seeing the food reminded them of that state and they would feel nauseous and not eat it. I actually have my brother as an example for this one for two things. Um, I have no idea why he did this. Uh, actually, no, I do know why he did this. He was doing it to impress uh, someone's parents as a little kid and another one time was to impress a girl he liked. So, uh, and in both <laughs> cases, it involves food. So one time when he was staying the night at his friend's house, he wanted to seem like he was a big boy. I don't know. He was really young. And uh, they had his, this, this jar of cashews, and he liked cashews. So he wanted to show off how big he was by how much he could eat. By the way, my kids do this too. It's a kid thing. And I kind of remember doing the same thing. He wanted to show how, how big he was and eat, by eating well, he ate the whole thing. And it was way too much for a kid his age. So um, <laughs> and I'm sure that their parents love this. Uh, he's spending the night, and so then he's sleeping, and he gets really nauseous. He just throws up all over. And of course, the parents have to clean it up. Um, but after that episode, my brother can no longer eat cashews because it makes him want to throw up. Even just the thought of or the scent of uh, those cashews make him want to throw up. Why? Because it's like past experiences weren't good, so he doesn't want to eat them again. Otherwise, I'll make him feel like that again. Yeah, okay. So what would they be operant or classical conditioning? Classical. Why is it classical conditioning? Because he um, isn't associating with another. Exactly. He's associating the uh, uh, stimulus, in this case the, the taste or smell or sight of a cashew, with the nausea. I have no idea what it is. My pen. It is gone. Oh, so I'll use this pencil. All right, cool. One, two. Exactly. That's classical conditioning. He also did it with Code Red Mountain Dew. 
Um, he was at like this youth group thing and there was this girl he liked there and they had this like eating contest and the last thing was like, you eat this, you eat this, you eat this. And the last thing is you drink this code red thing as fast as you can. And he drank the whole thing super fast. And then uh, he won, so yay him. And I'm sure the girl didn't even care. Uh, and, then he, uh, and then he immediately went and felt nauseous and threw up all this code red in the bathroom. Um, I don't think I got everywhere, but my brother now also gets nauseous and cannot drink code red uh, at the sight, smell, or taste of it uh, for that exact same reason. So you can actually do that. So what they do is they just use that same concept and then they apply it to whatever you want to stop. So whether it's drinking or smoking, whatever, they'll make you nauseous when you uh, drink or smoke. So that way, when you go to drink or smoke, you feel nauseous, so you don't want to. That's taste aversion. And again, John Garcia discovered that with rats. You guys got that? All right, you can also use token economy, which is basically just using operant conditioning to encourage or discourage a behavior. So um, I could, for example, and you can actually, this actually works, by the way. Um, let's say I've got a study, but we'll use the classic example. I've got a study, but I like playing video games. And usually when one gets home, especially as a teenager, it is much more likely that they will fall into the pit of video game playing as opposed to the uh, um, taking the route of studying. However, and obviously we can see why. The, the video game is fun, you get the dopamine hit immediately, you see your friends and the, the studying is boring and you don't, even, you don't even see the benefit till later. Uh, it, it's really hard to associate those things. What you can do though is you can trick yourself somewhat by rewarding yourself for studying. So what you do is, and you do have to have some self-control for this, you go in and you study first, and then immediately when you're done, you reward yourself with something you like, whether it's video games or food or whatever. And you do that every time. Uh, so over time, your brain starts to as, kind of associate the behavior, or at least if you don't associate it, you realize that as long as I do this, I can reward myself. Uh, you can kind of use operant conditioning to encourage a certain behavior uh, or not. Uh, so um, uh, reinforce a beneficial behavior. Uh, I don't think that there's like a way to self-punish yourself, by the way, uh, if you do something you don't like, at least not that I'm aware of, but you can encourage yourself and, or others uh, to uh, engage in a specific behavior. Cool. And the last one is uh, a sad one. <coughs> oh, no, no, learn helpless is the last one. That's a sad one, but law of effects. This is, I think, Edward Thorndike came up with this one, and this really, really influenced uh, Skinner, by the way, and I think Watson, too. Um, this is the guy that came up with the law of effect. He realized that if you, and this is partly intelligence too, if you engage in a behavior and you get an outcome you like, do you think you're more or less likely to engage in that behavior? More. More, obviously, you got what you wanted. So let's say you do actually study for a test every night for a week and you get an A. It's like, well, that worked. You'll probably feel good, right? Yes, so next week, um, because you saw you got the outcome you wanted, you are probably more likely to study again. What if the opposite happened though? What if you studied and you bombed it worse than you ever did? You'd feel terrible, correct? What do you think the odds are that you would study the next week? Less. They're definitely less, especially if you never studied before. If that was like your first time, like, no, I'm gonna study this time. And you study and you just get totally wrecked by the test. Next week, there's almost, well, not almost no chance, but there's a much lower chance that you're gonna try studying again because you didn't get the outcome you wanted. All right, that's the law of effect. And again, that's you applying intelligence too to some degree. All right, this is the last one, and this is the sad one. Uh, this one is uh, learned helplessness. Yep, this is the sad one. Uh, this was, was it Robert Ruscoe again? What, was Tolman? Yeah. Okay, Tolman, thank you. Um, I thought it was Rescorla. Oh, no. Is it Rescorla? Uh, let's take the name off because I actually forget on the top of my head right now because I've got all four of them screwed up in my head as to which ones they're associated with. Nonetheless, I think it was wrong. Can somebody look that up real quick on their phone? I don't know. Just look up learned helplessness and see which psychologist's name comes up. Because I, I know one of them doubles and I thought it was Rescorla. Regardless. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll get it up there in a second. This is the sad one. This is where animals can realize, and so can people, by the way, they can realize that even if a negative stimulus, um, even if a stimulus means a negative outcome, if they can't avoid it, 
they will stop trying to avoid it. So here's what I mean. If I put a dog in a cage, and I actually did this by the way. If I put a dog in a cage, and then every time a light comes on or a tone sounds off, doesn't matter what it will say light. Light comes on, they get a shock in one part of the cage, all right? They'll pretty quickly learn to associate that, right? Let's say it's this part of the cage. Light goes on, they get shocked. They will try to avoid it, right? They'll figure out eventually that this side doesn't get shocked. So what do you think they do when the light goes on, if they're on, this, on the side that shocks? Light goes on, and what do you think they're gonna do? They're gonna go the other side, right? Really quickly. Um, and they do, obviously, to avoid it. However, if, and this is the sad part, if you don't allow them to escape it, like let's say the whole cage is shocked, or you chain them down to the part that does get shocked, and you keep doing it, initially they'll try to avoid it, right? They'll bark, they'll pull, they'll jump. Uh, but once they figure out that they cannot avoid the shock, they will stop trying to avoid it altogether. So the light goes on and they'll just lay there because they know they can't get away from it, and they'll just take the shock, essentially. That's called learned helplessness because there is, um, no way that they can affect the outcome at all. So they just know, here's the light, there's no way, nothing I can do to avoid it, I'm not gonna try. Humans do this too, by the way. It doesn't have to be pain, you all have the sad face, I understand it. Uh, but there are examples that aren't just painful. Um, let's say, let's say, uh, hmm, what's an outcome that I might want? Okay. Let's say your friend, who you like hanging out with or playing video games with, he's constantly failing his tests and he's constantly getting grounded. All right, so you can't play video games with him, you can't see him like over the weekend, like ever, because he just keeps playing video games, doesn't study, and then gets grounded on the weekend. You with me on that? So you want your friend to uh, study and get a good grade so you guys can uh, play uh, video games over the weekend or, or spend time together, right? That's what you would want, correct? Mm -hmm. Let's say you try everything. You're like, no, 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 please don't. Um, and, you, and you try to study with him. Uh, you try to uh, uh, convince him to. You try to uh, convince his parents to not apply that punishment or apply a different one. You try everything you can, but no matter what you do, every week the kid doesn't study, he gets grounded, you can't see him. What's gonna happen eventually from your perspective? Are you gonna keep trying to uh, get him to, to uh, study? No, why not? Because you know there's nothing you can do. Would that be learned helplessness? Yes. It would, yeah. You're helpless to get this kid to do what you want him to do, so you just give up. Right? That's essentially what learned helplessness is. Obviously, he found a pretty extreme and um, unethical way to do it. Uh, nonetheless, it makes the point. It's any time that you can't affect the outcome. When you realize you really can't, it doesn't matter what you do, that thing is going to happen. You cannot stop it, so you don't even try. Because why would you? Why would you put an effort to something that has no impact? Right? Like, if I lift weights like crazy, it's not gonna make my friend stronger, so why the hell would I try that? That, that wouldn't be a, a, a very good, and that's not a very good example anyway, but that's an example of there's no way what I do can affect the outcome. Um, yeah, that's a good enough example. I think that's the last one. We'll save the biofeedback for later.